everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Talk movie crew. First up, senior producer, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. And we just realized that we are three pasty white dudes with attitudes, all in black shirts. We didn't plan it this way. I totally swear. <laughs> you guys look like a gang. Look at us. <laughs> we look like, look, look oh, a, no. look like a ghost floating in a black curtain. <laughs> <laughs> Got my orange crush. <laughs> <laughs> also here, it's writer director John Schnepp. Hello, my name is John Schnepp. <laughs> I am ready to drink the orange soda now. Let's go have an action scene. That's a cut, Miss Rousey. Okay. And also, Christian Harloff. We didn't plan it this way. Email. Guys, wear black shirts today. Look <laughs> tough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with the, a new all-female Ghostbusters film currently in production and set for release in 2016, many reports and stories have been circulating about possible Ghostbusters spinoff films in a shared cinematic universe, most of which have revolved around Channing Tatum and Chris Pratt. However, we can put all those stories to rest. Legendary Ghostbusters producer Ivan Reitman recently issued the following statement. There has been a lot of excitement recently about what is happening with the Ghostbusters <laughs> franchise. As the producer of the new Ghostbusters film, I feel the need to clarify. There is only one new Ghostbusters movie, and that is the Paul Feig-directed version coming next July. Presently filming and going fantastically. The rest, it's just noise. John, can we now confidently put the talk of other Ghostbusters films to rest? I want to talk about Ivor Reitman's use of the word fantastically. Oh. That, was, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I like that. He, I, as a matter of fact, I kind of wish they had done this earlier. I mean, look, there's been a lot of buzz going around about all this stuff. And, and you know what? This isn't one of those situations where it's like, Everybody thinks Batman versus Superman is being split into two because of some some anonymous person put up a screen cap of a thing. This isn't like that. There actually has been. I think it was Drew Pierce. Yeah. What's actually oh, saying? Dan Aykroyd too. Yeah. Well, Aykroyd's right. been talking for ten years, right. but I mean, so this isn't like one of those baseless things. So people have been wondering about it, but the fact of the matter is, Chris Pratt a few weeks ago said, "Look, dudes," because people were asking him about that. Because I've never even heard of this. He said, actually, I've gotten together with Channing Tatum a couple times, and I've still never heard of this. Channing Tatum's producing partner about a week ago said, dude, there is nothing to this. There were some talks like five months ago or six months ago, but that never turned into anything. None of this is going on. So now with Ivan Reitman coming out and making this statement, I'm hoping that lays it to rest, and I believe him. I do. Um, so I, I like that he did it. My only wish is that I kind of wish he had said something a little bit sooner. Christian, what do you think? I don't think it lays it to rest, um, unfortunately. I think that what it... And as far as Tatum and Pratt go, who knows if they were ever talking about it. But I do think that this shared universe thing is at least a plan. It is Sony. Um, and they are they are they are trying to get a shared universe going still. I think they are. I think what happened, this is pure speculation on my part, but I think that is Paul Feig going, Hey guys, can we focus on my movie and can we focus on the fact that we are doing an all female Ghostbusters thing and by doing by talking about this other male Ghostbusters, you're you're kind of downplaying what we're doing here. So if you're gonna do it, please do it later. Let's see how we do it this one. And I think that he that maybe he went and talked to Reitman about it because if so anybody has some clout right now, it's Paul Feig. He's one of the most talented comedy directors out there right now. I think they should have laid back on it because let's see what happens with this female Ghostbusters first. And then I still think that if this movie does well, you're going to see a shared universe. I don't want to see one, but I think you'll see it. Chip? I thought for this whole shared universe thing started with all those Sony email hacks and they were talking about like a Men in Black Ghostbusters mm -hmm. spinoff. Or was it like a 21 uh, 22 Jump Street was, Men in Black yeah, spin? Something like on. something yeah. really weird. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. But once again, that. that's going back. Six months, yeah, a year, yeah. but yeah, not, half, yeah, yeah. Drew Pierce was like popping stuff off on Twitter, just talking about you know, but he was even saying, Look, I didn't even write a script, I wrote an outline, and the way I want it is to be in one universe, not like these multi universes. That's Dan Aykroyd talking about, we've got an entire fabric of like 48 universes, so I mean, <laughs> who knows what it's really going to be. But I agree with what Reitman's saying, is like, let's just focus on this one and that's what he's doing yeah. i think you're all right he's just saying hey look whatever is actually gonna happen doesn't matter this is what we're doing right now so and a lot of this stems from the dan Aykroyd 
stuff. And I, hey, Dan Aykroyd, good Canadian kid, right on Dan. But he he has been talking Ghostbusters for so long. And I remember it was about maybe a year and a half ago, he was talking, we got plans for, for spinoff TV shows and for new comic books and for five different movie franchises and blah, blah, blah. We got big plans, big plans, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I mean, yeah. It, and it's kind of, uh, I tuned out Dan Aykroyd for, at least for Ghostbusters really. So I just tuned him out about a year or two ago because he talked about it for so long. I think you raise an interesting point about Paul Feig. Maybe he came and said something. I, I wonder about that because his movie's still a year away. So what's the point of It's just the fact that, that it's an yeah. all-female. It's the first time, and, and initially when you hear, some people didn't jump on board with the all-female Ghostbusters true. too. Yep. And now every time we get pictures about it, it's like they, they need to get people to go, look, look at the cast that we have. Look at this. And if right. we have that cast and pictures of all the girls, and then, but don't worry, guys, we also right. have a male one coming out too. It kind of diminishes a little bit what they're doing over there. So if that is indeed the case... But I don't know. No, that's a good point. All right, what's next? The newest trailer for the upcoming Johnny Depp film, Black Mass, has hit the web. In 1970s South Boston, FBI agent John Connolly, played by Joel Edgerton, persuades Irish mobster James Whitey Bulger, played by Johnny Depp, to collaborate with the FBI and eliminate a common enemy, the Italian mob. The drama tells the true story of this unholy alliance, which spiraled out of control, allowing Whitey to evade law enforcement, consolidate power, and become one of the most ruthless and powerful gangsters in Boston's history. Christian, what do you think of the new Black Mass Trailer. I'm on board, man. I mean, I could feel. I mean, obviously, we know that Whitey Bulger was an inspiration for The Departed, and you can see that in this trailer. Yeah. Um, I also like. Um, I forget the, uh, the the kid's name from Breaking Bad, who's in in, in the interrogation. Jesse yeah. Plemons is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he, I'm glad he's in it. I'm, I'd like to see what his involvement is. You talk about a guy that can go to zero to psycho really fast yeah fuck, dude so i'm curious <laughs> what ha has happened there and i love the the look of johnny depp man he looks like the beginning of a white walker especially in that picture that, that raised guy yeah, right down there he, very that. vampiric he, yeah he does yeah. he really does and i and this is what we've been talking about with this movie in general is that this is what we want to see johnny depp doing now granted he's still in makeup and he's still playing a bit of a weird dude but this is the acting chops yeah. that you know of him and that you want to see from him. Right. And this goes, and I haven't seen a really good gangster film in a while. And you have yeah. this, you got Legend coming out. So this could be the resurgence of the gangster mm -hmm. film. And I, I'm, th this is a story that I re I'm fascinated by too. Not just that we've seen a little bit of it in The Departed, but that's spun off. This is, this guy was notorious, did some gruesome stuff. And I want to see a guy like Johnny Depp portraying him. So I really dug this trailer. I, I unreservedly loved this trailer. I liked the first trailer that right. came out, but it kind of like, I remember when the first trailer came out and then the first trailer ends and it says, Joel Edgerton, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, blood, this person, this person, uh, stole all these guys. I'm like, where were they in the trailer? Like right. nowhere. This trailer now comes out. Like that first one just gave us a taste. Here's here's a taste of what this movie's gonna be. Now this trailer, this is I believe the first true trailer for this right. because it gives us a little bit of insight. This is what this story's about. We get a really good look at Joel Edgerton, who I think looks amazing in this. Yeah. I'm a huge Joel Edgerton fan. Uh, and his new movie coming out, The Gift, which even though it mm. looks bad, everybody I'm talking to has seen it, says it's outrageously good. So I'm really pumped about that. We got a sense of the story. We got a really good look at Johnny Depp playing this character. You, I, you get that sense of, you look at this guy, he just looks a little creepy. You see him and you experience him and you are intimidated. Yeah. And that's what this trailer communicated. And if the job of a trailer is to either get you in, interest in a film or increase your interest in a in film, this trailer did it. So yeah, I just loved it. Yeah, this this trailer, this new trailer had the vibe of Goodfellas and Casino. This yeah. had that that you know a, a lot of amazing actors a really a big story yeah. a big juicy story that's filled with like horrible violence and terror and and you know it, it just had a, a very large feeling to it i i love the trailer i think uh, johnny depp this this is like kind of like that oscar buzz for me like i think this is going to be something that when it comes out people are going to nominate him they're going to start talking about yeah. it I, I just hope it's not public enemies because that's what oh, I thought. Because when, yeah. when Public Enemies came out, I felt the same way, and then just like, and it was a, a huge letdown. And I love both him and Michael Mann. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. But you know what I didn't love about this one too, and I'm probably in the minority here is everything I loved about the the very end song just threw me out a little bit too. I just didn't think I it can't matched. remember it. To it be just honest. it just didn't match the trailer vibe yeah, for me. I agree with but, you. But that, I but totally that was, agree with but you. But that's a, a minor thing. The movie yeah. itself was great. I think what we can all agree on though is that the one thing this movie obviously needs at this point is more black T-shirts. You do that. 
Yeah. You're going to be fine. It's a win. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's next? Speaking of new trailers, the latest spot for the upcoming Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart film, American Ultra, has hit the web. American Ultra centers on Mike, played by Jesse Eisenberg, a seemingly hapless and unmotivated stoner whose small-town life with his live-in girlfriend Phoebe, played by Kristen Stewart, is suddenly turned upside down. Unbeknownst to him, Mike is actually a highly trained lethal sleeper agent. In the blink of an eye, as his secret past comes back to haunt him, Mike is thrust into the middle of a deadly government operation and is forced to summon his inner action hero in order to survive. Schnepp, what do you think of the American Ultra Spot? Um, this new trailer was fun. It some of it, to be honest with you, it felt like there was a little bit of a weird tone shifting going on back and forth. The Topher Grace, scene, uh, the Topher Grace scenes just felt too like I'm in an action comedy, and then some of the other scenes felt like, uh, oh, okay, it's Jesse Eisenberg doing like his kind of uh, the Zombie Land thing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, I know the script uh, by Max Landis will probably be really fun and weird, but right now I just I, I'm kind of like stuck in the middle somewhere. Like I, I'm looking forward to seeing it, but the trailer didn't really do anything for me. I, this is a weird trailer yeah. for me because I watched the trailer because two things happen. I watch the trailer. I'm like, this isn't a very good trailer. Yeah. Yet I'm oddly interested in seeing this movie, mm -hmm. even though I hated their last movie together. Uh, what was it? Adventureland? Adventureland. I hated that movie. I thought it was just awful and it feels like it's a little bit of a poor man's long kiss good night you remember that yes uh, with that, the, yes totally that was a great movie. samuel jackson was so good in that um that was a wonderful movie so it's weird i don't like the trailer i don't think it's well put together you're right about the Topher grace stuff feeling very awkward and and whatever and yet it i, I finished watching the trailer going yeah, I got to see that. I don't know how that works, but that's the way it is. Did you guys see the first trailer? Yeah. Yes. I loved the first trailer, and I thought it's it, it's like Pineapple Express meets Born Identity. <laughs> um, it's so it's, it's a good comparison. It's bizarre, yeah. and I actually and Chris uh, Kristen Kristen Stewart the last couple of performances she's been getting away from that Twilight thing, and yeah. she certainly did it with Still Alice, and she yes and she did the last yeah. movie she's I can't remember the name of it, but she's she's getting away from that, and in this she's still playing kind of like the kind of mopey stoner, but I think there's going to be a little bit more to it, and it's going to have to call on her to do that in this type of vibe but it's what you said Schnepp is the script by Landis that I'm that, that guy he, he's quirky he's out of his mind and I want to see everything he writes because you're going to get different yeah. you know, this is what this movie looks like to me it looks different I agree with you 100% that the Topher Grace stuff you couldn't have said it better that it looks like he's like hey I'm in an action comedy movie right. check me out I'm over explaining <laughs> stuff yeah, and yeah, doing weird hand like, I look like Mark Ellis um, and then they're gonna do this and ride around and do that yeah, right. like, what movie is he but, in but I know? still but I still really like the trailer because I think that this is the perfect combination for all this quirky weirdness um, and it's different and I'm looking I want to get some more different yeah. movies and I think this is a movie that could do that yeah I, I, like I said I it's, it's really weird to me I'm yeah. oddly on board all right, folks, it's Friday, so that means it's time for our new segment, Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is the segment where we simply do this. We, here on the panel, are going to try to predict, in order, what the top five films are going to be at the box office come Monday morning. I think I did pretty well last week, actually, okay. uh, but... I'm really going to butcher this week. I'm absolutely positive I am. So we're going to go around the table here. We got a couple of new movies in it. We still have Ant Man, Minions, Pixels. Um, you know, Paper Towns is still out. We got Vacation coming out. We've got Rogue Nation coming out. So, Schnepp, let's start with you. What are going to be in order the top five films of the box office come Monday? Number one, Pixels. <laughs> Number two, Pixel. Terminator Genisys. <laughs> Number, oh, wait a sec. I'm sorry. We thought, we're rolling, right? We're filming. Uh, Number one, Rogue Nation. Mission Impossible is going to take the top spot without a doubt in my mind. I think Ant-Man is going to stay number... He's going to stay on a number two area. I think Vacation will be number three. And then I think probably... Sorry, Ray. The end of the tour is not going to be in the top five. <laughs> um, even though I'm looking forward to seeing that movie. What's it? You said it's playing in five theaters. I, no, I'm not sure. Not many. Um, not a lot. I think Trainwreck will be number four, and I'm going to go with uh, Paper Towns as five. All right. Here we go. So my predictions. Number one film, uh, not by a mile, but I think the number one film is going to be Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, which, by the way, we're actually going to be shooting a um, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation spoilers review today. So uh, get ready to watch that a little bit later. It'll pop up on our Collider Video YouTube channel here a little bit later this afternoon. So, yeah, for number one, it's going to be Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. I'm going to be shocked if anybody at this table doesn't say that. 
I think Vacation is going to come in number two. Um, because I don't think Ant-Man is going to... Because Ant-Man made about $30 million last week. So that's going to be at least probably down to about twenty. And I do think Vacation will get over that. So I got to believe Vacation will be number two. I believe Ant-Man is going to hold on uh, above all the other films that were already out. I think it's going to come in third spot. Just barely. I think Minions is going to be our number four film. And I think Pixels <laughs> will come in number five. I think Trainwreck is out. It's hysterical. I have I have a mixed, uh, you, you're both of your, as you're going through your list, so I'm like, oh, that's mine. Oh, and then it switched the last two. And then you, oh, I'm like, wait, that's mine. And then you switch the last two. Okay, so here we go. For me, I got Rogue Nation at number one. I got Ant-Man coming in at two. Oh. I got Vacation coming in at three. And then I have Minions and then Pixels. Mm. Okay, so a little variation yeah, of ours. But I am also curious to know what Sinead thinks. Sinead, you look at what's out right now. How do you think this is going to shake down on Monday? Okay, I have um, Rogue Nation in at number one, without a doubt. I think Ant-Man's going to hold strong at number two. Mm. Then I have Vacation at three, um, Pixels at four, Minions at five. Oh, a little bit of a mix. So it's a little bit of a mix all yeah. the way around. So hey, guys, we want to know, what do you think? How is the box office going to shake down this weekend? Make sure you jump into the comments section of this video below and write out your predictions. But write them out today or tomorrow. Don't wait till Monday to put them in there because that obviously does not count. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on. What's next? As many of you know, the new NWA biopic Straight Outta Compton is hitting theaters on August 14th. Last night in Hollywood, a number of film journalists were invited to watch a screening of the film, including our own John Campia. So, John, we all want to know, what did you think of Straight Outta Compton? Yeah, um, last night, myself, uh, Dennis, Wendy, we went to go see Straight Outta Compton. I've been really very curious about the movie and really quite excited about it. Um, here's the thing. Overall, I enjoyed the film, and it's one of the films. I, it's a film I recommend people go see. I'm going to say, if people ask me, do, should I go see Straight Outta Compton? I'm going to say, yes, you should, because I think you're going to enjoy it, and I think you're going to get something out of it. That's the overall general thing. But I didn't love the film, and I wanted to love the film, and especially because of this. The first, not quite full two acts, but like I'd say, the yeah, maybe the first two acts, like the first 60 to 65% of the movie, I remember I was sitting in my seat in the theater watching it, and I remember thinking, holy crap, this is going to be one of my, you know, if not totally my favorite film of the year, it's going to end up being in my top five. It's going to end up being in my top five favorite films of the year. The director, F. Gary Gray, he approached this film, and especially the first two acts, with what I call an absolute laser focus. I mean, he has, he just starts to develop this recipe of bringing these characters together introducing us to them in a very nicely paced way so that we feel like it doesn't feel staggered. It just feels like this really incredible pace. We get to know these guys. We get to like simmer in it a little bit, seeing the dynamics of the relationship come together, how they get this whole thing started, the introduction of the Paul Giamatti character, how everything starts to unfold and, and things start to blow up, become big. Some of the major key incidents that led to them being who they are and all this kind of stuff. It was just a magnificent biopic kind of a film uh, for the first time. The music was great. Um, a lot of the performances, I just brought up the IMDb page here too. Um, a lot of the performances were just incredible. Corey Hawkins, who played Dr. Dre especially, was fantastic in it. And also Jason Mitchell, who played Easy. These two guys really stood out to me. They were just incredible. And then getting into the story about how things started to then come apart. And, you know, the, the, the division off and when Ice Cube left and why he left and all that kind of stuff, it was just being held, being conducted masterfully. I just was eating it all up. The problem is that after the first two acts, once you get past the first 60, 65 percent of the movie, it's almost like F. Gary Gray, the director of the film, left and some other guy came in to direct because it felt like a totally different movie from that point on. If I had to guess, if I had to give a score, I'd say the first two-thirds of the movie, I would give like a 9.5 out of 10. Mm. The last act of the movie, the last third of the movie, the last 30, 40% of the movie, maybe a four. Because what was so brilliant about the first part of the movie, laser focus, really getting to know these characters, taking time on the things you needed to take time on, rushing past the things that didn't need a lot of time wasted on them, that just all went out the window. Suddenly they're trying to cover 85 different things 
Interesting. Whereas in the movie, it you know they take like twenty to thirty minutes showing this slow evolution of the parting of the ways between the guys, and then in the third act of the movie, a thirty second scene. Hey man, let's make up. Okay, hug, and it's done. And it's like, what is this? And then they start throwing like some scenes with Snoop Dogg, where it's like there was no purpose. Other than, hey, you know what? People like Snoop Dogg, so let's just put him in. And it, was, it wasn't actually Snoop Dogg. It was an actor portraying Snoop Dogg who did an incredible Snoop Dogg imitation, by the way. Anyway, then they have scenes, oh, let's put, people like Tupac. Let's throw in a scene with Tupac, even though it served the story no way, shape, or form. And they, it just started becoming random collections of scenes. I, I, I was really torn by it because it's like, these are two completely different films. What happened and where did this thing go? But, like I said, that first two acts are so brilliant and so good. It doesn't matter how bad the last act of the film is. This is a film worth watching, if for nothing else in those first two scenes, especially that what I call the climax scene of what <laughs> sort of should have been the last scene of the movie, and it was only about a little more than halfway through, which was that infamous concert in Detroit um, when they got arrested and stuff like that. I mean, that would have been a great climax to the movie, as a matter of fact. The other problem I had with the film, though, too, is Dennis and I talk about this quite a bit, like whenever, whether they're talking about doing like a, a Walt Disney biopic or a Martin Luther King biopic, you know, sometimes you get concerned about, well, who's in charge? Because are they just going to, if they do a Walt Disney thing, does members of the Disney family or members of the Disney Corporation have final say over what you can and can't? Because are they going to sugarcoat it? Or are they going to give us a true look at the life? This movie is so sugarcoated, you're going to walk out with cavities. Like it is... It is so sugar-coated. Everybody except for Suge Knight and the Paul Giamatti character are made out to look like warrior poets. I mean, everything is so crisp and clean. And one of the things I was really fascinated to see was, you know, for those of you who follow NW at all, you know the whole incident with Dee Barnes, the female reporter who did an interview with Ice Cube after he left NWA. NWA felt like the, that television interview portrayed them in a negative light, and several months later, Dr. Dre ran into her at a party and proceeded to beat the living F out of her, uh, while his bodyguards held people off because as retaliation for that. They, I was afraid they were going to like sugarcoat that incident. They just didn't address it at all. All. I mean, they took that out of the movie entirely, and it's like, and Dre comes across in the movie like this, this pacifist kid who's, you know, he sees Suge Knight, you know, uh, committing violence. He's like, no, he's horrified by violence. And it's like, that's not Dr. Dre, and that is not what is in this. And it's like, the, the whole movie is just extremely heavily sugarcoated to make everybody look as great as possible, and that's what you're going to get when members of the NWA are the guys producing the biopic of NWA. That's what you're going to get. Still, despite the heavy sugar coating and despite the fact that I feel like the film, I, I really think F. Gary Gray left. I really do. I honestly think somebody else came in and directed the last half of that film because that was a different dude. Despite that stuff, like I said, the first hour and a half of this movie are so good that it glosses over everything else. It's something you're going to see. My overall score for it is going to be 7 out of 10. Hmm. Right uh, question for you. Yeah. Uh, now, I remember on Movie Talk, maybe a year ago, when we started talking about this movie, you had a lot of... You were hesitant and almost a little... Yeah, I think you had, we might have a rant about it, too, about uh, Ice Cube's son. Son. Uh, how did he do in the movie? All right. So here's, here's what I'll say. A lot of the performances were great in this. I thought going into it, as long as Ice Cube's kid who's playing Ice Cube doesn't distract from the movie, it'll be fine. And he certainly does not distract from the movie. And as a matter of fact, I'll go as far as say he added to the movie. Hmm. Would it have been better if they went out and got a real actor to do it? I think it would have been better. But what they did a lot with him, and this is what a good director like F. Gary Gray will do, they utilized him in ways that would make him most effective. So a lot, I was joking about it, but it's true. The greatest strength that he brought to the role was, holy crap, does he look like his dad? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's his greatest strength. So... A lot of what they did was have they had him in a lot of scenes, almost every scene he was in, do his dad's signature snarl with a tilted head. Yeah. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it at all. That real that iconic look that Ice Cube gives. He just had him doing that a lot, right? And they didn't give that character, say, the emotional range that, that Dr. Dre's character had, that Easy E's character had, that the Paul Giamatti character had. They kept him more limited, but that was a good thing because he actually was able to then be more effective. So since they did that and he looked so much like his dad and they kept it fairly simple, it worked. Hmm. It really did. It, it worked. 
but I still believe it should have gone to an actual actor where they could have maybe done and explored a little bit more. Right. But I have nothing bad to say about his performance. He it was he, he was fine. He was absolutely fine in it. All right, folks, listen. Another new film that's coming out here pretty soon is the new Meryl Streep film, Ricky and the Flash, written and produced by Academy Award winner Diablo Cody. I thought I heard somebody say, hey, Diablo Cody, who actually came into our studios last night to sit down and talk to us about the film. We want to share just a little bit of our conversation with her now. So here, take a look. For a lot of people, we have Ricky and the Flash opening up August 7th. For people who don't know much about the film yet, just tell us a little bit about Ricky and the Flash. Ricky and the Flash is the story of Ricky, played by Meryl Streep, who is um, a woman who always aspired to be a rock star and who didn't quite pull it off, and but is still sort of following her dream of being a musician and is still out there playing rock and roll and is very passionate about music. However, her adult children are somewhat estranged from her because they feel that she chose her musical ambitions over them when they were growing up. Right. And so it's about her trying to mend that relationship. You know, when we look at sp specifically your other films, and especially if we're going to look at films like Juno, you know, adults, things like that, you have this great way of a lot of filmmakers with some great success focus on the action. Some like to focus on, you know, what the circumstances are or some elemental piece of the puzzle. You always seem to really focus on characters. You really always draw our attention to the people, you make them the focal point. Why is that important to you? And why do you think that works so well in a movie like Ricky and the Flash? Well, I, I do definitely like to write character-driven things. And I think it, in a way it's what I've defaulted to because it's the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could write one of those amazing plots that are full of twists and turns. Right. Um, it, if I could, maybe maybe I should give it a try. But no, in my, in my case, I'm just fascinated with human nature. And I'm fascinated with the how... And I, I don't really, obviously I believe in good and evil, but I think most people are somewhere in the middle. Right. And I think that ambiguity in that gray area is so interesting to explore. Ricky and the Flash opens in theaters everywhere on August 7th. Keep your eyes open for that. And you can find our full interview with Diablo Cody on our YouTube channel. Just take a look there and make sure you subscribe to our channel as well. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Every day we take a couple of your questions. Sinead's got a few of them pulled out, so Sinead, what do we got? Tasso writes, I showed the Dark Crystal to my brother. It was his first time seeing it. And I found, though the dialogue and a lot of the elements were clearly 80s, it still held up, as did the special effects. I was wondering, if they ever do a remake, do you think that they would use motion capture, CGI, or puppets like in the original? Which would you prefer and why? First of all, God bless you for introducing people to the Dark Crystal. This movie is so good. The Skeksis are still some of my favorite film villains Ever with sure. the Chamberlain and stuff like, like that, uh, they're just that was good. so wasn't <laughs> that? That was good, huh? They are so great, and then the the ancient ones and all that, kind of, and then the whole mythology when one dies, the other one dies. I mean, it's just it's done so well, and it's so charming because it was done by the Henson Company, and it's mm -hmm. it's made with all Muppets and stuff like that. It's very very cool that way. They have been trying actually for years to get a sequel off the ground. They they've got they had scripts, they got storyboards. Actually, they even put out some concept art. If we got that, um, where they had this piece of concept art where this is Kira actually from the original film, and now she's like the Empress of the land, and it's like hundreds of years later. I'm assuming Jen has died at some point, and a new adventure was going to start. And they put that image out. And this was like three years ago that this picture came out, and I lost my mind with excitement. But they just can't get it going, and it's staggered and staggered and staggered, and and then all of a sudden projects like Fraggle Rock get you know prioritized over it and stuff like that, which I'm really disappointed about. If they were to do it again to get a new one going, I have no doubt of two things. Number one, they would absolutely heavily because they're the Henson Company, they're going to heavily rely on puppets. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely going to do that. But because it is no longer 1986, or, or I believe that's the year it came out. They're also going to utilize some CGI, but I think the characters themselves will probably be Muppets if they ever get around to doing it again. Shep, have you heard any more about it, and how would you like it to be done? Yeah, I've been lucky enough. I've been working on a project with the Henson Company, and so I've been there, and um, they've got a lot of advances going on with puppetry right now. So their creature shop, they do a lot of uh, combination work now with where 
the puppeteers are actually moving and manipulating computer graphics, um, you know, creatures, but with puppet devices. So mm. I would see uh, the Dark Crystals being a true synthesis of like pu puppeteering, animatronics, and CG. So you know, and I think they will eventually do a Dark Crystal sequel. They want to. They've got it going. They just need to get the finances. So I'd love to see a Dark Crystal movie. You know, who's actually a big fan of Dark Crystal, which would, I blew my mind was Joe Manganiello. Really, he's like a huge Dark Crystal fan. Um, I'd like to see, like, it'd be interesting to see whether it be a guy like that or an Andy Serkis involved in performance capture with that movie and using Muppets and everything yeah. too, because that movie calls for an epic scale film as well too. What you yeah. can do, a really great fantasy film. I would love to see that. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned, oh, you know, and then the Fraggle Rock kind of took priority. Why? Why would Fraggle Rock take priority over the Dark Crystal? I mean, to me, the Dark Crystal is screaming for a sequel. I don't need a remake. I need a sequel to that yeah. movie. I love the idea of it taking place 100 years later because what that would force people to do is when that epic new movie comes out, they go, well, what's the origin of that character that I love? Then you go back and introduce people to what happened in 1986 yeah. and how that all went down. So it's a combination of doing the stuff with the new technology today and then making people go watch the old stuff. Kind of what Tron kind of failed at a little mm, bit, you good, know? good point. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I, I would love to see that. Yeah. All right. What's next? Presetio writes in celebrating the opening of Mission Impossible: Rogue Nation. How do you rate your favorite movies of the Mission Impossible series? Ah, well, this new one is my favorite, and it, it, they, they almost go in order for me. me for me, they break down like this. My favorite one is Mission Impossible Five. My second favorite is Mission Impossible Four. My third favorite is Mission Impossible Three. My Fourth favorite, and this is where it finally switches up, is the first Mission Impossible, and my least favorite of the Mission Impossible films is the one uh, that, if you believe the trailers, was starring Anthony Hopkins, who ended up being in it for two minutes, which is Mission Impossible 2. So yeah, I would go five, four, three, one, two would be my order. What about you? I would go five, four, three, one, and then one, uh, can I put the Bourne movies or something in there? Because I don't want to even put two in there. Uh, <laughs> I put one yeah, but I, I have the same exact list. Yeah. Just, two is a separate movie. It's, yeah. It has nothing to do with the Mission Impossible. It's a John Woo action film. Right. Get it out of there. Schnapp, what about you? I had the same exact order. Uh, five, four, yeah, three, five, one, four, two. Yeah, five, four, three, one, two. Yeah. yeah. But it was really tough for me because five and four are the best. Yeah. And so I was Clearly, like, I yeah. kept vacillating between four or five. So. I could just to be different. I'll say four or five, but uh, no, nah, like the fifth one was so it just has fulfilling. The story is so like, good. Yeah. yeah, the the action the action scene at the end of this one I thought beat number four, and that's why five wins because I really loved four. I thought you know yeah. the Brad Bird did an incredible job directing. Yes, he it was did, such yeah. an amazing action film that it made me want to see another Mission Impossible. I couldn't wait for Mission Impossible five. And Mission Impossible five delivers yeah. on all fronts. Yeah, and it, it, it's so we'll talk about this yeah. in the spoiler. spoiler room. I mean, right out of the gate, right yeah. as soon as bam, boom, this movie starts. You're into it. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's from beginning to end an incredible action film, and it just it made me forget about Bond and Bourne. I was like, I can't wait for Mission Impossible Six. I would never thought I'd say Which that. Which they're talking about starting yeah. shooting next summer now, all of a sudden. All right, what's next? Jimmy writes, hey, Collider crew, I'm glad the crew is still together, and I watch every day. Are you guys surprised at how The Wizard of Oz remains a part of pop culture, despite it being released 76 years ago? It's cool. arguably the only movie of that generation that remains a part of pop culture. Whether it's movie quotes or the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow, what are your thoughts on the status of Wizard of Oz in today's culture? Yeah, there are certainly other films from the era that have iconic status. Statuses, but you are right, there is very few that you could mention in pop cultural context that everybody will instantly recognize. Like you go up to somebody and say, and your little dog too, everybody knows what you're right. talking about. You say there's no place like home, everybody knows what you're talking about. You say, I'm melting, and everybody knows what you're talking about. For me, like The Wizard of Oz holds a very special place in my heart because it was one of those films where every Christmas season, not on Christmas Day, but every Christmas season, one of our local networks up in Canada would play Wizard of Oz a couple of times a week. And I would watch it with my family, my mom and dad, we'd watch Wizard of Oz and it's just magical. The themes of Wizard of Oz just transcend era. Do the visual effects of Wizard of Oz hold up? Obviously not, they do not, but the themes do. It is one of those fantastical fantasy films that this movie, you could watch this in the 1800s had the technology existed. You can watch this movie in 2020 and it's still going to be the same thing. There's something so magical about that movie that transcends generations, transcends era, transcends cultural context, 
that is just enduring. And parents now continue to share this movie with their kids. And and it almost doesn't matter what kind of parents you are. Like, not everybody like me and, and Christian will show their kids Star Wars. Not everybody will. But everybody will show their kids Wizard of Oz. And there's you're right. That makes it unique amongst the pantheon of Hollywood film history. It's just crazy that way, Schnepp. I absolutely love this film. I've adored it since being a kid. I played the Scarecrow in my high school musical. <laughs> I got to see that. Uh, oh, it, yeah. it was me and Kevin Heffernan from Super Troopers. Is that right after Ferris Bueller? School. Yeah. No, that was before. <laughs> okay. A little bit before. <laughs> but uh, absolutely love Wizard of Oz. In fact, I saw it again when they released it at the Grauman's Chinese for its 75th anniversary. Oh, that's right. On the big screen, and it completely still IMAX, holds up right? in IMAX. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's such a well-shot well made, well written. All the musical numbers are incredible. Even though we represent the lollipop, world, you know, so every single song is memorable. And I, if you, I mean, who, who's watching this? Who's never seen Wizard of Oz? If you haven't, get to it right now. Right after we're done yeah. watching oh, this, absolutely. watch Wizard of Oz because that's going to be one of the films on our oh, thirty yeah. films over thirty years totally. old. You got to watch. I mean, it absolutely would be. Yeah, I mean, it stands the test of time. I actually saw it as well uh, for the seventy fifth in Grauman's this mm -hmm. IMAX, and it just and the reason why you know normally if it was a screening and we didn't have to, didn't have to do a review of it, I just wanted to see it again. Yeah. I wanted to see it in the big screen because it reminds you of being a kid and reminds you what your imagination will do. It reminds you where when you're a kid what where that will take you and it also shows you what movies can do and what they were able yeah. to do back then um and it you're right it does it, it just t it, it doesn't matter when you watch it because of the themes and the story and you take the musical not everybody's into musicals right. like I, mark ellis can't stand musicals but you talk about you talk about uh wizard of oz he'll talk your ear off about mm -hmm. it because it's just it's that movie that's it, it the songs it plays to the story it plays to what it, you're, you're somewhere over the rainbow just being home being family the lessons everything in there that's absolutely my my daughter right now is three and a half and she's got a horrible fear of witches so i have to wait on that one but <laughs> pardon me she won't even watch tangled uh yet I so, so yeah, yeah so so i'm gonna i'm gonna wait to show her but you're right when the time comes and that fear goes away a little bit I'm probably sure Star Wars first, but then I will show her uh, Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. All right, folks, listen, we've run out of time here. That'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing at our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this episode, our podcasts are up and running again. Just check out our podcast feed and you can get them there. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me sitting over here. Mr. John Schnepp, also known as Black Shirt Number One. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You find me at TDOSLWH uh, and also on Twitter at John Schnepp. Check out my film, The Death of Superman Lives. Uh, I'm sorry, The Death of Superman Lives. What happened? It's not.com. Go to <laughs> www.tdoslwh.com to check it out. Of course, sitting over here, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, you can find me every Thursday hosting Collider Jedi Council. Make sure that you follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, we, Mark and I have started this trivia contest. Uh, and it's oh, a, right. It is yes. a 15-week trivia contest called The Ultimate Schmodown. We do that on our channel every, uh, every every Thursday now. It started last week. And the reason I bring this up is because next week, John Campia, who has teamed up with Tiffany Smith on Team Geek, is going up against JTE and Finstock. And we need your help out there, Collider, to make memes, show these guys their support, because Dennis and Schnepp are also in the tournament as well. It's going to be pretty crazy because the smack talk has already begun. It's, it's going to be like... You know, it's going to be so unfair. It's like Ronda Rousey fighting anybody. Wow, I like the smack talk, Camp. Yeah, I, I almost like don't. It. I, I can probably show up twenty minutes late. It's wow. no, or wait a yeah. sec. Are you saying Dennis is Ronda Rousey, or I'm Ronda? No, no. Rousey. You, you and Dennis are on a separate team. He's talking about yeah, going up against Finstock, Finstock and JT. And, oh, yes. okay. Because then, uh, then ultimately, we'll end up taking that you, Ronda you Rousey. You guys might play each other. <laughs> yeah. You guys both win. That, that's a match. That's a match. And of course, our lovely host today, Miss Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sinead DeFries and at thatsoshinead.com. And of course, you can find me on all the various social media networks on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us and for Collider Video. Bye-bye. <laughs>